Passion Harvest. <laughs> Hello, passionate listeners and watchers. Welcome to Passion Harvest. I am Louisa, your host, International Passion Ambassador. Thank you so much for being here. This is going to be an awesome episode. If you like this episode, please do subscribe to the channel. My incredible guest today is Michael J. Tamura. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Yeah, that's great. Great. Michael, <laughs> Michael Tamura awakens souls to their true purpose. Michael has had five near-death experiences. Michael lives the miracle spiritually aware from childhood. He sees you the way you are as immortal souls to guide thousands to their healing, awakening and true purpose. He draws from years of intensive training, past life recall, nightly out-of-body sojourns. This is going to be so exciting. 47 <laughs> years of teaching and giving clairvoyant counselling and a lifetime of extraordinary experiences. Spiritual teacher, clairvoyant visionary, radio show host and award-winning author of You Are The Answer, Michael teaches psychic tools and spiritual practice to, practices to awaken souls. Michael and his wife, Rafael, also host their own weekly radio show, Living the Miracle, on the Voice America Talk Radio Network. For Michael, every step in life offers a golden opportunity for healing miracles and the fulfillment of one's divine purpose. This is his story and this is his passion. Michael, I'm so honored to have you on the show. Welcome to Passion Harvest. Thank you. It's great to be here. <laughs> Let's get started. I can't wait to dive in. I've got so many questions to ask you. I always, I can't believe anyone doesn't know you, but if someone is not aware <laughs> of what you do, just a bit of a background of how, obviously you said you were a psychic child, but you know, all these experiences in the time frame in which we have, what were the pivotal moments in your life that led you to where you are today? Mm, through grade school, I was bouncing between the gifted class one year and inevitably the next year I'd be put into the remedial class, which of course the kids called the retard class. Right. <laughs> right? Yeah. And then well, you, can say, you the, can say that because you were there. Yeah, I was there. <laughs> <laughs> I was the retard. <laughs> and so, so then the next year I would be put in the gifted class. And then the next year I'd be in the retard class. And, and, um, then finally, in fifth grade, I started in the, the remedial class, the bottom of the barrel class where kids that were just weren't learning anything type of a thing or couldn't mm -hmm. learn were stuck in there. And about a month into the class, the teacher jumps up and tells this other boy and myself, okay, take your desk and chair, go down to Miss Wilkinson's class. So I got transferred out. And Miss Wilkinson's class was the um, gifted class. Uh -huh. And I remember staying, you know, in, in this remedial class, it was battleship gray. The class was gray. Mm -hmm. And, and every day it's like going to prison, but I did the best I could in it. Then when I walked down the hall, it was only three doors down, walk into Miss Wilkinson's class. And it was like a field of daisies, yellow daisies, it was all this bright yellow. It was happy, light. And I was so glad. Oh, thank God I, I get to be in this class. Yeah. But I had difficulties because it was the gifted class. And in school, it's all about the intellect. I had a problem with that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that was the main thing why I got tossed between the two extreme classes. I couldn't quite hack the intellectual advanced class mm -hmm. where you memorize everything and you make up, you know, reasons for everything. And you could read and write and better than everybody else type of a thing. And I didn't fit into the remedial class because I was too smart for that. But they never put me into the regular class. <laughs> they it's knew very something. interesting. <laughs> yeah, they knew someone was, this guy is not normal. <laughs> We don't how, know if he's subnormal or above normal. <laughs> obviously, you spoke about auras, but how do you define the, the differences in the two energies of the space? So is, it, is, is the, the colors or the daisies, as you mentioned, and the grayness, is that mm -hmm. a result of the souls that were in there or is that from the space itself? It's from the space itself. And 
the like the gray is just a lot of fear. The teacher was really old school kind of military. Uh, he reminded me of Ichabod Crane, you know, the headless horseman, Sleepy Hollow story. Um, he's kind of a grouchy guy, and and uh, uh, he uh, really, I saw him as a person with a heart, but he was very tight and closed off, and everything was rote repetition, you know, just mm. droning in. And he was very, very stern. So the kids were scared of him. And, and so all that fear and boredom and everything turned kind of everything gray. It's not because the kids were dull, and it's not because the teacher was really bad or dull. It was just the fear and apathy. And then when I went into Miss Wilkinson's class, there was a lot of enthusiasm for intellectual pursuit. Yeah. All the kids there were very smart intellectually. And I didn't understand what that meant where I'm being asked, okay, Michael, it was always like this, okay, Michael, what do you think about this? What are your thoughts about this? What are, what are your opinions about this? And I didn't have any. <laughs> <laughs> My mind would be a complete blank and I just go, I don't know, I, I don't have any thoughts. I was telling the truth. But at that point, I didn't know that that was a result of many lifetimes of meditation. <laughs> you know, like in the Buddhist type meditation, they always talk about empty your mind. I had so an empty mind. Yeah. And, but in school, an empty mind was not good. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm just I thinking for, of... you know, for, for tools for people that, a potentially obviously as a child you can't necessarily control your environment and sometimes as an adult if someone is potentially in a, in a gray space or surrounded by negative energy or people how do they bring some light to themselves or how do they bring some light to that space when they're unable ah. to physically uh, remove themselves it's great and the way you asked it how do we bring light to it is we have to be there it's, you don't have to bring light to yourself because you already are light. You can't help it. It's, mm -hmm. that's who you are. And so, you know, the saying, you are the light of the world. Yep. I understand that. It's, that's how I see everyone. Everyone is this bright light. It's just that some people don't recognize it. They don't see it. They don't, you know, pay attention to it. Other people do. Now, to bring that enthusiasm, the joy, the peace, the goodness, the beauty into one's life, even if you're in a gray situation, a gray environment, yes. is number one, you got to be yourself. And that seems like, you know, it goes without saying, but most people are not being themselves. They're in competition to try to be better than who they think they are. So right off the bat, as a person thinks in terms of, I have to be better, I'm improving myself, I've got to get better, they're starting with a place of lack. They're starting with a place of, I'm not good enough as I am. And from that place, you start building up a false um, foundation of who you want to be rather than getting to know who you really are. And the more you're present, the more you're here, going, here I am. You bring that light. And the more you decide to share. So when we recognize that I'm here to share, I have a lot to offer. But again, a lot of people don't think that about themselves. They think, oh, I'm not famous, or I'm not, uh, I don't have a Nobel Prize, or you know, I didn't get an Academy Award or whatever. I'm just a normal person. Well, you want to be that normal person because a normal person is extraordinary if that person is being him or herself. But a person who's trying to be extraordinary, they start dulling their own light because they're in competition with themselves. They don't recognize themselves. So they're trying to be something other than who they really are. 
And that's what makes things dark instead of light. The more we are ourselves and the more willing we are to share ourselves with others, that's how we bring light into the room, the environment, the world, everything. It's, it's really a, simple. What a beautiful way to explain it. And, and just as you were talking about it, it's very hard sometimes to be ourselves, our, be our true authentic selves. But when we're, when we're in that now, in that space, I find that our souls, our, our persons, our me, does expand to be a better, greater version of ourselves anyway. It's like a, a snowball effect. Yeah, because when you start to share, when you start to express yourself creatively, you're giving yourself permission and space to shine. If you don't do that, you, you're like a light, you know, bright light bulb with a lampshade over you. <laughs> it gets filtered. You're still less bright, but you just have a shade on, on top. Yes, take that shade off. Take the shade Rip off. Rip it off. Yeah. <laughs> it's hard. Rip though. it off. <laughs> I just want to touch on what you said before in the beginning that you saw your own birth or you were aware of your soul or your your self coming to this mm -hmm. earth. My question, interestingly, is do we come into our physical body at the moment of conception or in the womb? Um, when I came in was after birth. You know, just shortly okay. after birth, I start to make my landing. And I pretty much, people I've seen, how they came into their births usually do that around birth, even a little bit afterwards. Not and in the because womb. who who wants to be, <laughs> who wants to come in when you're all cramped? <laughs> you're you so experience? funny. <laughs> it's meant to and be a safe, to, secure environment. <laughs> I know. I think the ones who 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 came in before the birth all become Olympic losers, right? You know the loser <laughs> skeleton, the one that goes head first <laughs> on the ice. That must be why I'm flexible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you have to be a contortionist. <laughs> uh, I don't like small spaces and being squeezed. <laughs> so I, I think I'll wait until the body comes out. And would that, would that have anything to do with people that are claustrophobic? <laughs> sometimes, I'm not laughing. Yes. <laughs> sometimes I'm sure if you get hung up and you're, you become aware. Well, one of the things, when there's a body survival that goes on. So if you get, if you're being naturally delivered, you know, in birth, at birth, and let's say the body gets stuck in the canal mm -hmm. and, you know, and then of course, doctors or midwives or whatever, parents are freaking out. All that fear and traumatic level, you end up being called, the body says, hey, you got to get in here and take care of this. Right. Because the body can't do it by itself. You're the life. You're the life of the party, right? Sure. The spirit is the life of the party. Without that being, there's no life. So when there's life, that physical life is at, in jeopardy, you, the being, gets called into it. So Very some people will experience that. And, and later on, they might have that memory of, hey, get me out of here. <laughs> So, so we do choose, in, in, your, in your opinion, we choose to come back to this life. Yes. We choose to be reincarnated in the physical body. And how that works with some souls, it's, it's you know, just like that. We choose it. And I, I, but what brings us back for reincarnation is desire. We call that karma. You know, sometimes mm -hmm. it's called karma. Karma is essentially when you have a desire, you have to fulfill that. There's a cycle. By wanting something, you create a cycle. And until a soul really wakes up to itself as spirit, limitless, immortal, it's, it assumes that, oh, you know, Last lifetime, I didn't get to marry the person, you know, of my dreams or who I love and mm -hmm. we got separated and couldn't marry. Or uh, I lost my child or I didn't make it to the top or whatever the situation was. The desire. The unfulfilled bucket list, right? <laughs> and it's desire underneath. So 
you die with that desire. And if you take that desire with you to spirit, and then that desire needs to be completed. But the desire inherent in that desire is have to be in a body. You're the body wanting something in this world. That's what reincarnates us. Is there a point in, well, I'm not going to say time because there is no time, but is there a point that we evolve to a high, such a high level of consciousness as a spirit in the physical body that we no longer need to reincarnate? That's correct. And yeah, then, absolutely. Then, then what do we do? It's like this whole thing here is like a video game, very, very much like a video game. The Matrix. And, yeah, and uh, mystics and enlightened masters have always said, the world's a dream, right? The world is just a dream. And now in technological terms, we can call it a video game. <laughs> it's very much like it. So when we get tired of playing the video game, what do we do? We turn off the video game. But the video game still goes on for everybody who's still wanting to play it. Like now they have video games all over the world. Everybody plays each other online and it's very sophisticated. I think that's a great analogy for what we're doing here. But at any given point, you could be champion video game player with this video game you're playing with everybody else on the planet. And one day you go, okay, I've had enough. I'm done. I no longer have any desires to play this game. Mm -hmm. I don't want to get more points. I don't want to do this, that. I don't have to do any of that. And then you go, okay, I'm done. You turn off your video game, you're out. And, and probably I, nobody will miss you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I'm sure you get this question all the time. I do as well. Why would one come to this earth because of, of the suffering? Why would one come to suffer? None of us come to suffer. Okay. It's, that's, that's a very important question to ask for each of us. Because on the one hand, pretty much all of us know that, that uh, aphorism, uh, ask and it shall be given to you, right? Mm -hmm. And it's absolutely how everything works. Ask, and it shall be given to you. No strings attached. It's just simple, effortless, and that's the way it is. If that's true, however, nobody ever asks for suffering, pain and suffering, right? We don't raise our hands and say, oh, I want to volunteer for more pain <laughs> and suffering. And, and yet... There's not a single one of us who hasn't experienced some kind of pain or suffering. And most people experience quite a bit of it throughout their lifetime to the point where it feels like most of the time here is full of pain and suffering. We never asked for it. How come every single one of us gets it? We don't ask to die, but everybody seems to go through that experience if you're here. Well, it's not because we ask for it. It's the consequence of what we ask for. When we want something, we're coming from a place of lack. We assume, I need this. I don't have it already. I got to get it, get it. And that I got to get that means I'm seeing what I have to get outside of myself. It's not within me anymore. It's out there somewhere, somewhere, and out there means the world, separate from where I am. So then I start to look for things outside of my own eternal, limitless beingness for answers, for solutions, for things, for happiness, for peace, for everything. And we start to try to control everything out there to try to get those things, <laughs> you know, oh, you guys are too noisy. You're disturbing my peace because my peace is out there. If the, everybody quiets down, I'll have peace. That's not true. Right. So this process of waking up to the light of our own being, to, to being spirit is turning our awareness inward and go recognizing, oh, wait a minute. Is it true that I lack this? No, it's not true at all. When you look inside, you have everything. Everything is in limitlessness. Out there is limited. Even this universe is limited. But when you look within, it's limitless. It just goes on and there's no end to it. And there's no time. 
So then when, once you turn your awareness inward, then you're looking in the, in a sense, the right direction for whatever it is that you're seeking. And you'll find it. Ask and you shall receive. Suffering is a result of looking for everything out there. Suffering is the result of being unconscious to the fact, to the truth that we already are. We don't have to become something. We already are complete. Limitlessness is absolute completeness. You can't have anything more. <laughs> it's your, your limitless. And so realizing that and realizing that just, you know, people talk, especially those who are much more spiritual, talk about God realization, right? What does that really mean? That means we have to, in our awareness, we have to make that which we call God, this limitless, all-giving, all-loving, all-peaceful, joyful, whatever, this wholeness, real, more real than making this world real. And this is why mystics have always said this world's just an illusion. It's just a dream because it's not the reality. The reality is within. And that eternal limitlessness is exponentially, limitlessly more real than this thing that changes all the time. And this thing that changes all the time we call the world around us changes with our every thought. It's more, more consistently changing than Wall Street, <laughs> stocks at Wall Street, because <laughs> it's every time somebody has a thought, makes a new decision, everything changes in this world. But it's not noticeable for each of us moment by moment because there's just too much stuff going on. But if you were to be able to see that, it's every little thought counts, every little decision, every reaction we have, whether we fall into the reaction or we just let the reaction pass and go, oh, that's just a reaction. I don't have to do anything about it. Just let it go. If I don't become that reaction and dramatize it, there's no harm. It just passes. And that ability or that function to to let everything pass is what we call forgiveness, right? But a lot of people find it really difficult to forgive because they're so angry about something. They're so sad about something. They're in so much pain and suffering about something. And they feel afraid that if they let it be and let it pass, ne there's not gonna be an end to that pain and suffering. So they get into competition again with themselves to try to end that suffering. And the more they do that, the more they suffer. But when they see the truth that, oh, this suffering is temporary because it lasts until you realize it's not real. It's made up. It's, and that's a really tough thing for most people it, it to is. realize. It is. I mean, there's two massively important points that you just spoke about. One of our soul's purposes is to understand that everything is within us, which I think, and, and to stop looking at our external landscape. It's fun, very hard because sometimes we believe this video game is absolutely real. Hmm. And the other point that I thought was so fundamental is that we actually do create our rea our, well, it's not reality. We create our hologram that we live in. Yes. Yeah. Just like we do if we log on to play a video game. We're so, not the only, you know, I'm not the only one. It's everyone creating it, right? Everyone producing it. So change your thoughts, change the video game. Yes. Essentially. It's, it's, it sorry, works so the same this way. This is in very oh. simple terms, but are we, we're all intricately connected we're still affected by those other energy souls that are surrounding us. Yes, we're not connected because we're not separate. Yeah. There's only one of us as spirit. There's a, what is it now? Almost 8 billion mm -hmm. bodies, but there's only one of us as spirit. You mean as a, as a universal consciousness? 
yeah, you can call it whatever. You can call it uh, God universal, or what? Yeah, God or spirit or anything. But, we are all one. Mm -hmm. So when somebody's trying to connect, you know, that's been a really uh, that's a tough lesson. I'm popular just... <laughs> world, word. <laughs> and when I watch people, what kind of mental image do they create in their own mind when they're talking about things? And almost every time, 99 out of 100 times, when somebody's saying, oh, let's get connected. I want to connect more, and, you know, so forth. In their mind, they're picturing this external connection, like putting an electrical plug into the socket, you know, and we're now we're connected. We got some electricity, right. right? Because in the physical world, that's what it looks like. But as spirit, if you do that, again, that's competition. You're not recognizing that you don't need to get connected. You already are the same. Right. You just have to recognize we're the same. And that's why, like, you know, in uh, India to this day, greetings a lot of times are namaste, right? Which ultimately means the light within me. The light of who I am is the same. I recognize the same light as yes. you, right? And... Of course, when I was in India and I hear people saying that to each other and everything, most of the people were just saying that just like we say, oh, hi there, you know, in passing. And how are you going? They're not, yeah, how are you going? Where are you, where are you going? Whatever. And, um, uh, but if you really practice that to really recognize, oh, yeah, I see the light that I am. You're the same light. I see the spirit that I am. You're the same spirit. But how we're expressing that spirit, that same one spiritness out here is completely different and unique and interesting. It's, so, a, it's a very hard concept to grasp. I Actually, that's, you know, putting a positive spin on the current times in which we're living. I've found that for me, even though we might be physically restrained it has been a great lesson for me and I hope other people that we can connect in the absence of the physical touch. We can use our spiritual touch to connect yeah. with others that we might, family members, loved ones that we can't physically see at this time. Yes. And that type of connection you're talking about is happens without us trying to do anything other than just putting, letting go of our defenses, letting go of our, protection we build up around ourselves all the time yeah because that protection is in response to our belief that we're separate i'm me you're you and you know never the twain shall meet yeah. unless i really like you then let's get connected and that's that's overriding all the stuff that has to come down before we experience not a connection, but experience that oneness or affinity. Whenever we experience affinity with someone, well, what is affinity? We usually talk about it in terms of I like you, right? I'm in affinity with you. Affinity means the capacity to experience oneness instead of division. I love that. But so yeah. why, do we, why are we drawn to some people, some humans, some souls more than others? Is this what you define as soul family or that's, we're all oneness? It's a very hard concept to... Yeah, grasp. well, I like the soul family concept and, and now you'll start to see more and more this idea of souls that are in multiple incarnations simultaneously. Same so-called lifetime, this current period, a soul can be incarnated in more than one body personality. So that's fascinating. Yeah. And I've known this for years and years and years, but, but it's just in the last few years that this concept started to come out and several people have written a little bit about it, not extensively in a few metaphysical books, but uh, I knew when that, actually came, start to come out into the mainstream a little bit even, that signifies the next step in the human evolutionary process. Because when a person starts to look at how can one soul be two different or three or even up to seven different people at the same time? 
It gets to be fun. <laughs> it is possible. It's definitely more than possible. It's, it's happening. Plausible. And, and this period in our history, I see more of that happening than ever before. And because as souls were evolving, we're, we're getting more capable. Mm. So in a sense, this isn't a very accurate way of saying it, but I, I've heard people say it this way is, oh, this is a split soul. It's not split soul. It's just the same soul extending itself into two lifetimes at the same time, two persons at the same time. In the now. Or, yeah, in the now. And, and uh, often my experience is most of the time when that happens, and let's say if it's just two people in the world, they generally don't meet even. Physically, they don't even meet. And they're having two different lifetimes at the same time, but the same soul. I have experienced that and I asked someone about that and they said it's not possible. Oh, it's definitely possible. <laughs> oh, well, we'll have to talk after this interview because I've got a question. <laughs> yeah, because this I, interview I is about you now. You, but <laughs> I, I brought it up because I saw that in you. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. Oh, my gosh. This is getting more it's not, exciting. What, yeah, it's not what, what else can you see about me? <laughs> 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 Nothing seems to be private on Passion Harvest anymore. Oh, that's great. It, my mind's thinking, oh my gosh, what else do you have to tell me? What, what else can you see about me? <laughs> oh, about you? Is, yeah. There's a lot. It's, you know, there was a period of time in your life where you felt like you failed or you weren't doing the right things and didn't get it right, right? Mm -hmm. And you had to fix that. But what was really happening is many of those things that you felt it didn't work out very well in the earlier part of your life was all experience and preparation for what you're doing now. Now you're here and on a global level, you're able to put out information and interview people and who have, you know, great uh, wisdom to share with everybody else looking for it. And and this is one of only, this is not the only thing. This is just one of the aspects of what you're here to do. One way to do it. Right. You're going to do other things. There's, there's a lot. You're just getting going here. <laughs> Are you going to tell me or I just have to wait? <laughs> <laughs> well, one of the things is don't wait. Yeah. It's part of what you've waited for is as if, your, your um, subordinate to a greater power, so to speak, that's going to tell you what to do and how to do it and when to do it. Yes, we are part of this great, what would you call it? Spirit what? or God yes. or whatever you want to call Oneness. it. Oneness. But each soul is different. And depending on what, what your, your learning curve is, now, sometimes in certain parts of a soul's development, they need some very strong teacher or some spirit guide even or the powers from above or whatever to say, okay, go stand on the corner of this street and that street for two hours. Don't ask why. <laughs> That's when a soul is developing what you might call faith. Faith that, oh, you're not the only one and there's uh, power so much more knowing and loving than you could even ever imagine. At that point, developing that faith, somewhere along the way, you're going to be put into a situation where you just have to take somebody's, you know, command and say, you go do this and you jump when they tell you to do it and don't ask questions. But and that later on, once you've learned that, then the opposite usually happens where you have to, when you're at the point where you're most asking, praying, even begging, you know, please tell me, show me the way, tell me what I need to do. When, how, which way. And it seems like you don't get an answer. It's like, okay, I'm not getting anything. <laughs> the phone hasn't <laughs> rung. <laughs> yeah, the phone hasn't rung. Nobody's bought me over the head with a two by four. And so you might end up waiting, but, and you keep on asking and there seems to be no answer. Well, in spirit, spirit doesn't intellectualize. 
spirit, spirit doesn't give you an a intellectual academic dissertation on what your next step is, especially at a point like that. But when spirit, you don't hear anything from spirit, and spirit doesn't seem to be showing you anything, you know, dramatic mm -hmm. or, or specific, it doesn't mean it's not answering you. What is silence? That's an answer. So uh, one of the simplest examples of that is how many times do most people ask something, what's wrong with me? <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. We all tend to ask that, what's wrong with me? What did I, you know? And then you don't get an answer. That spirit answering you, nothing. Silence means nothing. Nothing's wrong with you. Yeah. But spirit doesn't say, doesn't have a mouth to say words like, you know, there's nothing wrong with you. It's just letting you experience this absence of anything wrong. And so in your case, the non-answer silence in relationship to what do I do is total permission, total freedom. What would you like to do? It's, it's permission for you to create the avenue through which you already know what you're here to do. It doesn't have to look like what somebody decides it has to look like. You get to decide that. Does that make sense? It does. I love that. And this is, yeah. it, thank you. Thank you very much. And this is also what, you know, what, what you offer to souls is the soul's purpose in these lifetimes for many others. Yes. And we all know what the purpose is because in spirit, there's no time. And so everything's all there at once. The challenge when we are in this video game is here, there's a, experience of the passage of time even language everything i'm saying is in a single file right it's it's in one word after the other and i can't if i mix up all those words nobody understand what i'm saying it has to be in a certain order one after the other a then linear, everybody goes sort of like a yeah, linear it's total construct linear. of time yeah and then people experience this and assume Okay, everything happens in a logical order. Now, in spirit, it's all at once. How we bring it forth, how we express it in time and space, makes it linear, seemingly linear, but it's not linear. So when we look at our soul purpose, the whole kitten caboodle is all already within us as spirit, all done. There's nothing to map out and you know all that it's just when you know it's all done all you have to do is start to bring it out start to share it and you don't have to worry about okay please submit an outline on how you plan to share this <laughs> you just start to share it and it's going to come out in the right order and this is the challenging part for most people is they're too complicated they're, they're trying so hard especially people who are much more sincere, they're trying so hard and they have to get out of the effort of trying so hard. Then if they start to enjoy being here and enjoying life, then everything that need to do will start to show up. As you say one thing, the next word will be there. As you do one thing, the next knowing of what you do next will be there. You just, that's the part that feels like you follow someone giving you the information, but no, it's, it's already in you. You're just following the order in which the information is coming out. And it's a beautiful flow. I guess that the question I, I'm of the belief, but the question I have to ask, has the future already occurred? What yes, we determine no is the future. Yes, because there is no such thing as the future. And what I like to say is, is um, it's a lot easier to create what we would like now that in time and space will become our future than to try to predict it. <laughs> Pre predicting it, you're trying to find, okay, what's gonna happen? 
Mm-hmm. And most people don't realize when they're looking at looking for the future, they look in the future to see what's going to happen. They'll never find it that way. The future is you have to look right here and now within yourself. Then you'll see what the probabilities are. What have you been, the choices you've made so far and everything, and everything is already, your future is already coming out. And you just don't think it's the future because it's coming out now. But it's becoming what would have been your future if you go back in time (laughs) and look at it, right? So everything's already really occurred. Yes. But you still have choice. Yes, free will. You could do it or not do it. You can go the way it's already happened, or you can jump ship and come up with something completely different. But there is a gap that we can create in this seeming linear sequence of events in our lives. And that gap we can create, most of us call it a miracle. It happens out of nowhere, right? Yeah. It's, and why it happens out of nowhere is it happens out of no time. It's not in a, a logical sequence. As we understand it. Yeah, logical sequence. Oh, this should have happened, but it didn't. I should have been killed, but it, I didn't. I wasn't. I should have, you know, this, but th- that didn't happen. Or instead of this, that should have happened, this other thing happened. And we call that a miracle. It comes out of nowhere. And it comes out in this little gap we create in our mind, in our consciousness. We decide, oh, we can have the limitlessness of spirit. When we can truly have the limitlessness of spirit, in that moment, we don't, we're not holding on to any limitation. Like, oh, that's impossible. All that's up. Anything's possible. And anything's possible. And this is what I need. I don't know how I'm going to get it, how it's going to happen, how it's going to show up. But I let all that go and just have this total certainty in spirit of limitlessness. And something happens in some way that I couldn't have imagined. That's it's a great. A beautiful, it's a beautiful great message. It. It's magic. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's just the miracle of life. Yeah. But if we get stuck in the assembly line of, okay, A plus B plus C equals D. It's got to be that way. Mm. Well, we're asking for it to be that way. And it will be that way. Yes, we do create our video game as, as, as we spoke before. I'd like to briefly touch on if we have time or nothing. What, what is time? And we've just said there's no time. <laughs> <laughs> but it is of interest to many people, your near-death experiences. Ah, <laughs> well, it wasn't near death. It was, <laughs> uh, it's, you know, the technical part where your heart stops and you're not breathing and everything. Mm-hmm. The third time was, was the most, um, I understand, the most dramatic on this, the physical end. Yes. Because for me, I don't remember a moment of the physical side of the third time that I died because I was dead. <laughs> and in fact, the funniest thing about that is I was in the probably the best physical fitness health condition that I've ever been in, in my life, even better than when I was a young, you know, teenager in sports, right? Mm. So I was at the gym working out, because that's supposed to be good for your health. Yes. <laughs> uh, well, According to eyewitnesses, um, I was working out on the elliptical machine, and then I just collapsed. And so the person who witnessed that was an old man, just walked into that upstairs gym room for aerobic training. And he slowly, because he was an old man, he couldn't go very fast. He went downstairs again on the stairs (laughs) to say, uh, a man collapsed upstairs. I think he needs help. <laughs> <laughs> and you're laughing about it. Yeah. And then, oh, this is the manager of the, the gym. Uh, and I were friends. And, and so she knew I was the only one upstairs. So she just said, oh, my God, that's Michael. And so she goes to reach out for her phone 
well, you know, they got rid of corded phones. <laughs> it's all cordless. Somebody took the phone <laughs> and she couldn't find the phone, <laughs> oh, no. right? So she's yelling at this large gym. She's yelling at everybody. Who's got the phone? Who's got the phone? Running around. Who's got the phone? In the meantime, her son was a trained uh, EMT, a medic. And he was in college training to be a paramedic licensed paramedic, another step up from there. And he was home for the weekend. And this was a Saturday or something, I think, or Friday. And he was home for the weekend. And he was working out in the weight room, waiting for his mom to be off of her managerial shift so he can go out to lunch with her. Well, she knew he's the medic. So he, she calls for him while she's running around looking for the phone and says, OK, uh, Michael's in trouble upstairs. But he had been to the, uh, there's two upstairs. He had been to the other upstairs um, before because a woman who rented an apartment on that side was epileptic. And she had an epileptic seizure just the night before when he was there. And he had to attend to her, right? So he assumes that's where he has to go. Yeah. So he's up the wrong stairs at the far end of the building by the time she catches him going the wrong way and says, no, 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 he's on this side. <laughs> so anyway, um, poor people. This is, the, this is the part where when you're the dead person, so, so-called, all this is very funny. But when you're the- <laughs> oh, Sorry. <laughs> I'm glad when you were finding it funny. Everyone else was having a heart attack. Yeah, everyone else is having the heart attack. <laughs> and they're just going bonkers, right? Nothing is working. It's just, everything's going the opposite direction. It took a record 12 minutes, 10, 10 minutes for the ambulance service that was three doors down from the gym, like three or four doors down yeah. from the gym. It took them 10 minutes to get there. And the manager specifically told them, there's two parking lots. You have to come to the upstairs second floor parking lot in the back, don't park in the front because that's downstairs and then you have to take everything upstairs. Well, guess where they park. (laughs) So anyway, it just goes on like that on this side. But in the meantime, my experience is one of just being in this vastness. It's the initial experience of kind of being pulled out of my body is, is like a, going up this hydraulic tube. And, and so there's this tiny bit of inkling of consciousness of being here in the physical. And I sort of remember being on that elliptical machine. But bam, instantly I'm transported. What felt like initially uh, the furthest place you can possibly go in the entire galaxies of galaxies and be in the exact center of everything. That's what my experience was like. And I find myself in a place where I don't find myself. It's, this is the part where it's very, very difficult to put into any words because there is absolutely no time, but not only is there no time, there is no me. I cease to exist, not in the way of, oblivion. It's just total awareness, total peace, total joyous, whatever. And when I, it took me a while to even start to describe what it's sort of like. And the best thing I could come up with was somehow I came back with this idea of, I was right in the presence of the eternal flame of God's love. And other than that, there is no me experiencing anything. It's just the all, allness of everything. There's no Michael Tamura at all. Not even a consciousness that was separate from anything. It's just the total consciousness. And after I came back and started to have memory, I didn't have memory for uh, my memory of nine days before this event and six days after, completely gone. 
I didn't remember a thing of anything. People said, oh yeah, I talked to you just the day before. I have no idea. And, and then when I came back, it took me the six days to start to have the function to remember more than a couple minutes at a time. But on the sixth day, I remembered everything, except those 15 days worth of no memory. I still don't remember anything. And um, the experience, that portion where I cease to be, it's just, it's not not being and it's not not it's not being, but it's not not being either. It's just, there's yeah, no, I understand. no division whatsoever. And then that seemed like if I were to put it in terms of earth time, it was like three days worth. And then after that, then I start to have little by little a sense of myself, a sense that I had uh, ex an experience happening in relationship to something else. And that's, that happened when that started was when it's the sense of almost like turning around. And that's that turning away from the source, turning away from godness or whatever you want to call that. And as I start to turn, then some form of I-ness kicked in gradually. And then I'm going, oh, I'm experiencing this. And the first of my experience at that point was being surrounded by these huge, huge, giant, magnificent beings of light that when I came back, I realized, oh, this is what Somewhere in the Bible, Old Testament, I think, there's references to the seraphim type of angels that are huge and they're right around God's throne. I think that's how it's described in, in there. And I realized that's what that was because I'm trying to explain, you know, describe it as best I can to others. And it was like this ginormous being of, of white, pure white, brilliance and it looked like it had multiple multiple giant wings like several pairs of giant wings going like this and there were several of them around this eternal flame of god's love and the energy the experience at that point was so pure and holy it's again there's no words for it but it's just like nothing but nothing can get through. It's just total purity. And as I continue this turning around type of a thing, they went to that, they were staying there and I turned out and I was allowed to walk out or move out from this inner sanctum, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Then I'm looking over this, like a sense of a hill down and there's a sea as far as I can see, there's a sea of hundreds of thousands, maybe millions, I, I, don't, I don't know, it's of these angels, more of smaller, so to speak, re relatively speaking, and all white, but they're all, they all had this energy going in this wave pattern across this vastness. And I go, wow, it's just, as far as you can see, this holiness, this, this purity, this was the secondary uh, zone, if you will. <laughs> but I knew it was slightly below this first part. And then the next thing, I was transported from there into uh, what seemed like the middle of outer space, but you can't see stars or anything like that. It's just this vastness of this dark, but it's not dark, dark. It's not blackness. It's this sense of eternity and sense of limitless. It just goes on forever. Every direction, there's really no direction. It's just like 
floating as consciousness. There's no body or anything that I had. In the middle of this vastness of dark light. Uh, it's hard to describe. And um, then I notice it's like the, uh, a veil gets lifted off of this tubular space around me. And the tube seems to go all the way up and down, but this veil type thing, curtain, whatever, it gets lifted off. The scene is still the same. It's this dark light vastness. And next thing, what starts happening is um, these images, these scenes just started to like hyperspeed coming at me. And it's just, I'm in, I'm this nobody consciousness and these total holograms are coming at me. And each one was uh, horrific. <laughs> yeah, it, it's nothing sweet not, and kind. Not pretty and, and happy and No, not well. pretty and happy at all. It's, it's, uh, it wasn't like monsters. It's, it's just like one uh, unending horror movie type of a thing. Just scenes and faces and grotesque shapes and, and scary type images. And it's just coming straight at me. And uh, then I realize I have this inner prompting of, oh, just don't resist. Just let everything pass. Just let everything pass through. So that's what I did. And then I realized, oh, yeah, this is how the mind works. If there's, there's any kind of survival, any kind of fear and survival, and you have to defend yourself and all that, that all comes up and starts to resist all these images that go by. But if you don't resist it, they disappear. As it, right about what it seems like the moment of impact, it's gone. If you resist it, bam, it becomes your whole universe. It becomes your whole life. Yeah? And so I'm going through this and at the first round, I'm just, just have my awareness on, okay, just let it go, let it go, let it go. I couldn't think of anything. I couldn't pay attention to anything because it reminded me of, uh, not at that time, but after I came back, uh, I saw an interview of the guy, Frenchman, who had the world's record at that time of free diving. He went okay. down to like some ungodly distance into the bottom of the ocean on one breath of air but he had he practiced yoga and he had to do this special breathing and he said during that whole thing the secret was if he had even one thought during that whole time until he came back up he would be dead mm, and i thought oh yeah so he found his way of getting to that place at least in that environment not to have any thought or anything it's just letting things be. And so that's what I was practicing. And then after I got to a place where it's just going by and, and there was nothing, there's nothing to it, just fluff. Then the next thing I'm transported to uh, like a meditation hall and not a big one. There was about, I'd say six to eight other beings in a sense, sitting in meditation, even though none of us have a body, but in that space, we all had an aura. Mm -hmm. We all had a form of light. Instead of just being consciousness, it was a form of light. And all of our meditation instructions and guidance was coming from within. But it's like having this incredibly wise, uh, enlightened master guiding each of our meditations. So I sat there, so to speak, in meditation. And that's when I was really becoming aware that, oh, yeah, I'm going back into the incarnation and I'm being trained for this. This was kind of advanced training to prepare me for the next phase of my life in, in the body. And uh, so I thought, okay. And so I just 
approached it just like training and doing my practices. And then next thing, I'm back at that uh, empty, dark light, vastness. Same exact thing. The veil lifts and I see all this stuff coming. The second time was much easier. And, and then I was able to start to understand and realize, oh yeah, this is the key here. As long as we don't resist anything, we're home free. What a Our, great message. You know, earlier on, we were talking about pain and suffering. This is total pain and suffering. It's nothing more than resisting. If we resist anything, we, we experience pain and we suffer. But it's not real. Yeah? All this stuff, at first, we take everything as if you see it, if you smell it, if you taste it, you know, it's real. If you feel it, it's definitely real. It's not. It's all in the mind. It's all in the consciousness, field of consciousness. And so I went through that again. And so I, I'm starting to learn a lot more. And then I get transported to another, like a meditation room or hall for a different meditation. And then I walk, there's another place where I was shown the streets or this avenues going from one place to another in this space of higher learning. And I realized some of those beings that I passed by, we didn't communicate uh, a lot or anything. It's just everybody's in their own, what they're uh, practicing. And, um, but I was aware, oh yeah, some of them like me are going back, you know, maybe get born to, to teach. Others are going to stay in the spirit realm to be guides and so forth and so on. So a lot of spirit guide training, so to say. Wow. <laughs> whether you're here or there. And then, um, so I went through that tube and, and vastness uh, practice three different times. And in between, I was in these meditation halls getting instructions and training on what I would need when I came back here. So that was my experience on the so-called other side. <laughs> very, very different than any of the other uh, four deaths. It's fascinating. I think yeah. we're going to, if, if you don't mind, I'd love to do a part two to this interview at another time because there's so sure. many, so many yeah. other elements. We haven't even <laughs> talked about spirit guides or past lives or all your oh, other no, it's, yeah, it's needed like experiences. A lifetime training <laughs> wow wow <laughs> we definitely have to do a part two that'd be amazing all right but in the interest of time and there is no time um is there something you particularly like to talk about to the passion harvest oh, audience i like to talk about everything anything <laughs> and you've got such but a beautiful you... glowing smile i love it you're so happy <laughs> well yes it's um well laughter is really important you know it's, it's lighten up. It's, it's, it's a very important thing for all of us, especially those who are interested in their spiritual well-being and development. And with your audience, especially, you know, their focus is on their passion. I like to talk about passion and compassion. Isn't that interesting? The word compassion means with, oh, did you know Passion kind of comes from a root of suffering. <laughs> no, I didn't, but thanks. For yeah, it. but I think that's the different use of the word passion is, is because it comes from that, you know, what you want so much. And if you can't have it, you, you suffer. Right? Mm -hmm. But compassion is with suffering. What's that mean? Well, when we think about compassion and being compassionate, we think in terms of uh, being kind, mm -hmm. giving, and understanding, right? And, and compassion to me says to whatever, whoever's suffering, who's ever having a hard time, I'm, I'm right here with you. I'm not going to try to change you. I'm not going to try to do something to you. I'm not going to fix you. I'm here first and foremost to be with you. And I think that's the most important part, whether it's in relationship to someone you care about or in relationship to someone you bump into who's suffering or in relationship, especially 
to oneself. To treat ourselves with compassion, to treat others with compassion, means first and foremost, let that person, whether it's yourself or someone else, be. Just be with that person. And we can only do that to just be with someone is if we could be with ourselves first. We started this interview with that, you know, how, how do we just let ourselves be instead of being, in, to me, competition means we can't let ourselves be. We're trying to be better. We are so competition, enough. yeah, we're enough. And when you allow yourself to just be with someone, the best in you is going to come out. It's only when we're trying so hard to be better better than, more than, that we shut that door and the best within us can't come out very easily. Yeah. It bumps into that barn door. <laughs> An absolute fundamentally important message. So thank you so much, Michael Tamura, for being You're on welcome. Passion Harvest. And we'll definitely have to do a part two episode, which is going to be right. as fabulous. So I can't <laughs> wait. It's really been insightful and such an honor to have you on the show. Thank you. It's I've learned so much. To be here. Yay. <laughs> and I'm sure, I'm sure our audience will greatly appreciate it. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank Bye, you. Michael. Bye-bye. Bye. If you like this episode, please do subscribe for weekly passionate, inspirational interviews.